Hello everyone, I welcome you all for today's lecture. What we did last time, uh, we would look at it uh, in very brief. We discussed uh, the various aspects of uh, tin based chemistry and also silicon based chemistry, particularly for reductions and CC bond formation uh, utilizing radical mediated reactions. Uh, of course, we uh, used the uh, PMHS, which is polymethyl hydrosiloxane, then of course tris trimethylsilyl silane TTMS and tetraphenyl disilane that is TPDS in various kinds of reactions and we saw how they can be um, substituted uh, in place of the tributyltin hydride. Then uh, we also looked at the Barton McCombe reaction uh, and uh, we also discussed the utility of uh, catalytic amounts of uh, tributyltin oxide using uh, N-butanol as a solvent and of course uh, uh, phenyl thionocarbonate based uh, uh, substrates. Then uh, we looked at the reactivity of various kinds of electrophilic and nucleophilic radicals and uh, we compared them that how they could be um, utilized uh, in different uh, uh, ways. Now we will now look at uh, the asymmetric synthesis uh, where we will be taking uh, examples from oxidation reduction and CC bond formation to procure optically pure compounds and various aspects of these can be uh, very much useful in organic synthesis. So we have uh, uh, catalytic uh, asymmetric synthesis as eventually the uh, final goal. Uh, first and foremost is that we need synthesis to be done. Now why do we need uh, synthesis? As long as a molecule is required, as long as molecules, compounds, substances are needed uh, for different purposes, uh, for whatever, for, for uh, uh, as drugs or as materials or for any other purpose or food matter, uh, whatever substances or molecules or compounds have to be made and if they are not naturally available then of course synthesis is needed. Now when we carry out the synthesis the uh, improved methods have to be developed. There has to be a continuous uh, effort or uh, approaches to improve methodologies to make those molecules uh, for which synthesis is needed and uh, therefore uh, this is a continuous process of improvisation of methodologies to get the molecules. At the same time the cost of the uh, uh, process is important because that will affect the price of the product. Uh, so uh, we also have to uh, introduce methodologies or improvisations have to be done uh, which are also cost effective. Uh, at the same time uh, the process which requires uh, handling of uh, different reagents uh, and solvents and uh, byproducts which are formed they all have to be uh, entirely environmental compatibility. Of course we also have to worry about the energy aspect of it that means if uh, the reaction uh, requires too much of energy either at high temperature or at low temperature would also affect the, uh, the cost and um, uh, the uh, entire process could be a little more uh, difficult to carry out. So this is regarding the uh, synthesis part of it. This is how I have uh, written here as one. And the second thing is that uh, it should be uh, asymmetric. That means we need uh, the molecules uh, as chiral molecules. Obviously, uh, if there is no uh, chirality in the molecule, then we do not need not worry. But many of the molecules which are important, especially as drugs are, are chiral and therefore it is very important that we uh, worry 
about the uh, asymmetric synthesis that is the synthesis leading to chiral molecules. Chiral means optically pure molecules. Now the most drugs are chiral uh, molecules such as uh, enzymes, amino acids, carbohydrates, uh, proteins, uh, they all play very important biological roles in our body in cells and all other receptors are also chiral because uh, we have hormones, we have uh, proteins, we have uh, lipids, uh, we have carbohydrates obviously all of them are, are basically uh, optically uh, active, optically pure and therefore we uh, need optically active molecules as drugs. So uh, the point is that such clear chiral molecules which are biological which play biological roles prefer to bind with only one of the two enantiomers of the drugs and therefore it is very important that these uh, molecules have to be synthesized in optically pure form as high optical purity as possible. Now if one uh, looks at the uh, the history of uh, the asymmetric synthesis uh, one of the first things that comes on into the mind is thalidomide. Uh, thalidomide was uh, uh, having um, uh, problems uh, when it was introduced. Uh, when it was first introduced it was introduced as racemic uh, molecule and uh, it was later on found out that uh, only R thalidomide is, is sedative or hypnotic which is what used to be given to the ladies who were pregnant and who had a morning sickness and in order to avoid the morning sickness uh, this uh, thalidomide was given and uh, since it was a racemic thalidomide it also had the, um, the other uh, enantiomer which is S thalidomide which was found to be teratogenic and uh, uh, teratogen is basically uh, an agent that disturbs the embryo or the fetus and that is how when uh, the thalidomide tragedy uh, took place uh, in the late uh, 50s or early 60s it was that the children who were born uh, to the mothers who took thalidomide as a drug uh, many of them would uh, were found to have uh, various kinds of deformities because the embryo or the fetus was affected by this particular uh, enantiomer. So it is very important that um, the uh, drugs need to be uh, looked at uh, very carefully uh, from the point of view that which particular enantiomer is uh, useful and which is not. Uh, we can also see many other examples in which uh, one enantiomer behaves differently than the other. For example, this penicillamine here as it is shown uh, here has one asymmetric center and uh, this is its enantiomer. So this particular enantiomer which is shown here is an antidote for lead, gold and mercury poisoning. On the other hand, uh, this other enantiomer can cause optic atrophy, atrophy that is blindness. So we can see that if uh, uh, one takes uh, racemic uh, drug obviously you have 50% of this as uh, a drug which is not useful. Uh, in a similar fashion uh, for example if we take a carbon molecule if this is having one asymmetric center here and uh, its enantiomer is this one. So if uh, we look at R carbon this particular carbon it has spearmint or the uh, it is uh, having a particular mint type of order. On the other hand if we take the S carbon it has uh, cumin seeds uh, which is called in Hindi uh, jeera or caraway type of um, uh, flavor. So you see the, the flavor or the order becomes different if um, uh, the two enantiomers are uh, taken. So it is uh, in order to have a proper uh, order we have to take only one enantiomer. Similarly you have limonene, 
which is what having this asymmetric center and there is a mirror plane and then this is the mirror image. So this is an S limonene and this is R limonene. Uh, then we can see that the R limonene has orange smell whereas uh, the S limonene has lemon smell. So uh, you have odor, you have um, smell, all these things or the flavor uh, they are different because our receptors are also uh, made up of uh, optically active substances. So different optically active molecules or the enantiomers behave uh, differently to the receptor and react differently and accordingly the effects are felt. There is a need for chiral molecules. Uh, obviously as we discussed there is a need. Now how do we carry out and how do we do the um, preparation or the synthesis or making of such um, chiral molecules. Uh, it is uh, understood over a period of time that if uh, you have to carry out the synthesis of uh, a very important drug molecule or any other molecule of interest which involves several steps and uh, it is better that the, uh, in, uh, the chiral, uh, chirality is introduced as early as possible in the synthesis so that um, we do not generate too many uh, diastereomers later on. Uh, what I mean is that suppose if a molecule contains uh, 3 asymmetric centers, so the first one has to be 100% optically pure to start with so that uh, we can uh, keep on getting uh, better uh, diastereoselectivity as we proceed further. Of course we have to choose the reactions accordingly. Now uh, there are several ways uh, I have shown here 3 ways is that how you could uh, do the preparation of these optically active molecules. Uh, one of the ways is to do the resolution. That means if we have uh, say uh, an acid uh, which has an asymmetric center here and uh, there is a carboxylic acid and if this uh, particular molecule is uh, available as racemic then we use an optically active base. You, so you have an alkaloid uh, naturally occurring alkaloid or any other molecule which has a kind of basic um, character with the nitrogen and if this is optically pure then of course we can then carry out what is called as chemical optical resolution. So if we can resolve it so one can get plus or minus uh, as, as a salt uh, this is an acid and alkaloid is a base so we can get this as as a salt in which say for example if the chirality of this is minus so you have plus and minus and this and minus minus these are the two diastereomers and they can be separated by uh, say for example recrystallizations and then eventually you can uh, sort of uh, purify in such a way that the alkaloid can be taken off and then the plus acid or the minus acid can be separated. So we can start with a racemic acid and do the chemical resolution and get 50% of the plus and 50% of the minus enantiomer. Likewise one can also do that we can take uh, say you have an R amine, uh, you have an amine here and now it is basic and this has an asymmetric center but this is available as racemic and then you can use say you have a optically active acid uh, any other like for example lactic acid uh, which is um, available as optically pure then we can do the similar type of uh, resolution because that they will give the um, salt which can then be resolved and we can get the amine as 50% plus and 50% minus separated out. Uh, we can also do uh, that uh, uh, by, uh, via enzymes and there are ways of doing enzymatic resolutions also. So there are different enzymes which are available. Now there is something called as uh, a Chiron approach we can, uh, so once we have got this particular uh, say amine or acid or any such molecules in optically pure form then we can carry out the synthesis. 
the second one is uh, is called Chiron approach or Chiron approach, which where we use the uh, the chiral uh, nature of the molecule which is available from nature. For example, there are different types of uh, terpenes, there are different types of steroids, uh, terpenes, steroids or uh, you have uh, alkaloids or um, say acids like for example tartaric acid, lactic acid or many different types of uh, acids, amines or some hydrocarbons uh, which are small in, in size and have one or two asymmetric centers, uh, carbohydrates or amino acids. So one can, one can have a large number of uh, such uh, optically active molecules and uh, from there we can prepare what is called as chiral synthon. So chiral synthon means chiral uh, synthetic intermediate. So you have chiral synthon which means that you convert any one of these uh, optically active naturally occurring small molecules and convert that into a synthetic intermediate or an intermediate uh, which could have uh, multiple reactivity. So this is how uh, one uh, does uh, make use of uh, what is called as chiron approach or chiral synthon approach. The third uh, possibility is of course asymmetric synthesis. What asymmetric synthesis means is that if uh, you have a prochiral uh, say compound, so you have uh, say you have R and R1. Uh, so this particular carbon is a prochiral carbon and if we carry out say reduction or CC bond formation at this stage, so we can introduce uh, the um, chirality into it and once we suppose you have H here then this is now an asymmetric molecule it can exist in both the forms plus or minus. So if we do not have a, a proper procedure we would get the reduction in, in a leading to a racemic molecule. Uh, but we cannot proceed with the racemic molecule and therefore the reduction needs to be uh, giving a particular uh, enantiomer, say for example this enantiomer we want uh, and or this enantiomer we want. So if our procedure or our method is that this or this is formed in 100% optical pure form then of course we mean that we have a nice asymmetric synthesis of uh, converting a prochiral compound into an optically pure form. In this case uh, there are several ways by which one can do uh, uh, and uh, the problem is that if it is not a catalytic version then it turns out to be very expensive. So uh, catalysis uh, is the best way of uh, carrying out the, uh, this kind of conversion where prochiral compound is converted to optically pure form. It helps in if meeting that all the requirements that we can think about it. It, it, it has to be, one has to aim at uh, meeting the requirements of uh, improved methods, handling, cost effective, environmental compatibility and as I said the energy also. So, uh, uh, one can now look at uh, with this background the uh, Nobel Prize which was given in 2001 uh, which for um, the development of uh, catalytic asymmetric synthesis. So uh, these reactions or the asymmetric synthesis is, um, is basically known for a long time and it was first given. Uh, the one half of the prize money was given to uh, William S. Knowles uh, from United States uh, and Narayoji Noyori from Japan uh, for their work on chirally catalyzed hydrogenation reactions. So you have uh, say you have a molecule like this and uh, you have uh, uh, a substituent on this in such a way that it could lead to the formation of 
a molecule like this here and of course you will have two hydrogens here. So this is the, uh, the carbon which is now getting uh, an asymmetric center. So this is a prochiral double bond and if uh, we do hydrogenation and you have to use a catalyst and if this hydrogenation is used um, in such a way that it does not have any um, possibility of uh, inducing asymmetry in that means it the uh, if there is no chiral uh, handle so it will give a racemic molecule. But if we have the catalyst in such a way that that allows only either the plus or the minus an enantiomer to be formed in the major amount then of course it is called as um, chiral catalyzed or chirally catalyzed or asymmetric hydrogenation reaction. So these two gentlemen they shared the Nobel Prize for the, uh, developing the uh, chiral um, hydrogenation reaction. The other half was uh, given to uh, K. Barry Sharpless also from United States uh, for his work on chirally catalyzed oxidation reactions. So these people got for the reduction and they he got for the oxidation reactions uh, of, um, of type which are extremely popular and useful in organic synthesis. This is the William Knowles who was uh, born in 1917 and um, he got the Nobel Prize in 2001 as you can see and he uh, passed away in uh, June uh, 13, 2012. Uh, in, it is interesting to see that uh, after his PhD he was working in a, in a, farmers, in a, in a company, a Monsanto company uh, and of course retired from 1986. It indicates that uh, you can also work in a, in, a, in a chemical company and carry out uh, research which is of um, very use to the mankind and uh, also be recognized as William Knowles was recognized for his work on catalytic uh, hydrogenation. Noyori uh, was a professor at uh, Japan in, uh, in, uh, in Nagoya University here and uh, of course he has done a lot of work not only on this uh, hydrogenation reactions but a large number of uh, different reduction and uh, he is uh, a chairman of the education rebuilding uh, council uh, uh, in Japan. And uh, Sharpless uh, uh, was uh, uh, at Stanford University, he did PhD at Stanford University and now he is at the Scripps Research Institute in uh, United States in San Diego. So he did a lot of work on the oxidation reactions. So we would look at it uh, one of the uh, first reactions or a few selected reactions of asymmetric synthesis. As I said that Sharpless shared the 2001 Nobel Prize for asymmetric epoxidation and asymmetric dihydroxylation along with uh, Knowles and Noyori for who did uh, the reactions uh, of asymmetric reduction type. So what is Sharpless epoxidation? If we look at uh, the um, epoxidation reactions normally uh, what we consider is that we take a double bond and then we use any per acid and of course we get the corresponding epoxide. Uh, if we have a possibility of say you have an R group here then of course we have R group here. So this particular center becomes an asymmetric center. So uh, if we have a possibility of uh, epoxidizing such olefins to epoxides then we can have a very easy possibility of getting uh, this epoxide uh, as optically active molecule at the beginning of the synthesis on a very large scale. What uh, Sharpless did was um, the uh, epoxidation of uh, allylic alcohols to these epoxy alcohols. 2,3 epoxy alcohols. So you have allylic alcohols and these are 2,3 epoxy alcohols here. So you have uh, 1, 2, 3. So this is how 2,3 epoxy alcohols are formed. So if we start with a prochiral allylic alcohol, 
we have a possibility of getting uh, two different types of epoxides. And uh, what Sharpless has done is to develop a method where uh, simple allylic alcohols can be oxidized to the corresponding epoxy alcohols with reagents like titanium isopropoxide uh, L plus or D minus diethyl tartarate tertiary butyl hydroperoxide in the presence of uh, molecular sieves which is 4 angstrom. Now these uh, this protocol or uh, this uh, combination of reagents allows epoxidation to take place um, in such a way that the two different epoxy alcohols can be obtained uh, by the choice of which L plus or D minus which uh, diethyl tartarate is used for the reaction. It can be uh, compared to some extent uh, by the fact that if we take a simple allylic alcohol like this which has a beta OH uh, configuration then epoxidation takes place from the beta side. And this is because of the metachlorpropanzoic acid has a hydrogen bonding with the uh, hydrogen of the OH that is how it happens. On the other hand if we do not have that hydrogen present then and we carry out the epoxidation with metachlorpropanzoic acid then it is the steric factor which allows the epoxidation to take place from the opposite side of the, the acetate configuration. So these are just some uh, uh, diastereoselective epoxidations but for that you need the, the this, these molecules to be optically pure. But the Sharpless has developed this method of getting these epoxy alcohols with predictable geometry um, uh, starting from prochiral allylic alcohols. So we will um, stop it uh, today at this stage and uh, we will uh, take up in the next class uh, how this Sharpless epoxidation uh, can actually be carried out, what exactly is the mechanism and once we have got these uh, epoxy alcohols as optically pure molecules, what is the use of it and how these molecules can be uh, utilized for further synthetic transformation. So, uh, we will see you next time. Thank you and bye.